So, but you're here to listen to Leo, not to me. So without further ado, please help me welcome Leo Gibbs. <laughs> So Stefano, thank you very much for the nice uh, introduction, and I want to thank you and the department for the invitation to give this uh, John Postel uh, lecture. So, uh, well, I hope I can do uh, justice to all the compliments that Stefano gave me. Uh, I'll talk about uh, what I call the functoriality of data. I hope this term is not obvious what it means. I'll try to explain it uh, during the talk. And, uh, uh, you know, this is a, a John Postel lecture, who, and, and John was a networking guy. So uh, in this uh, talk, we'll talk about networks. Uh, but networks are somewhat different from the common network. These are not computer networks, uh, and they are not social networks of the no ordinary kind. They are networks of images, networks of 3D objects, and networks that are mixed, containing both 3D and images and other things in them. And the network structure is what I'm interested in. Specifically, I'm interested in these little light gray lines that connect the images, which are the relationships between the images. I'm interested as much as in the images, also in the space between the images and the relations. How are these things the same and how are they different? I want to make that notion precise and useful. That is the main goal of this talk. So uh, I'm going to use a couple of pieces of mathematics that are not so common in computer science. Uh, and I illustrate them here with the covers of these two books. I'm going to use a little bit of functional analysis and specifically linear operators in, because essentially I will formulate operators that decorate the edges of these networks, as you will see. And I will use also some ideas from homological algebra and algebraic topology, specifically the notion of functors and categories. Because as you will see, you, we will jump from networks of images and networks of shapes to what look like commutative diagrams in this field with many arrows connecting vector spaces. And because that's a special lecture, I thought I would not only focus on certain uh, technical books, but also on certain non-technical books. So I'll talk about two other books, one of whom you've probably all heard about, but perhaps haven't read, Plato's Republic. I am Greek, so I had to read it. I had no choice in school. Uh, and uh, in honor of my Italian host, I picked an, an Italian book by Italo Calvino. It's a delightful little novel uh, written in the 50s about the travels of Marco Polo, who arrives in the court of Kublai Khan in China and tells him about all these interesting cities that he's seen in between. And from the first book, we'll specifically use something that appears in the Republic and is known uh, as the allegory of the cave, this notion that if you had all these prisoners who were fixed in such a way that they only could see this uh, wall in the cave, and behind them there was a big fire burning, and then there would be these puppeteers projecting puppet shadows onto the wall of the cave. And if these prisoners, all they saw was the shadows, they would think the world is just shadows. They would think that a lion is nothing but a lion's shadow and so on. And so out of that little description in which I think um, Plato is talking to his brother, trying to explain some of the more philosophical things he was, he was thinking about, came this notion of the platonic ideal of something. This is something we don't see, but somehow it exists and captures the essence, the, the ideal of an object. And, uh, and related to that, from the Calvino book, we'll see that uh, there's some relation between all these fantastic cities that uh, Marco Polo visited and then talked about with Kublai Khan. And I'll come back to this towards the latter part of the talk. Now, I'm, as you know, I'm interested in data of a geometric character. And geometry is all around us. There's lots of data of this kind, and especially these days when we're being flooded with data. There is no shortage. And I'm interested in things like you know, GPS traces, or images, or 3D scans. And in each case, I'm interested in the structure 
of this uh, data. For example, these are all GPS traces from the city of Beijing. And those of you who may have been to Beijing can see the ring road structure of the city arising out of the uh, data. In an image, we may be interested in the foreground background distinction. In this 3D scan, we may be interested in the regular pattern of the windows of this building that our uh, brains can see right away, but computers can have difficulty in seeing. And of course, there is structure in all kinds of other data, I mean, time series, macroarrays, macromolecules, graphs, and so on. And to come to the main uh, topic, I'm interested not just in structure in data, but structure across data. Uh, that is a structure that relates different data sets. And here I show two examples. One is, uh, this is the area outside my office in the Clark Building at Stanford. This is a photograph. That's a 3D scan taken through a Kinect. These are clearly very related uh, because it's the same object in the world. But of course, they are very different as modalities. And down here, I show a whole bunch of images of skyscrapers, which are very different buildings. They are not the same entity in the world, but they are related because they belong to the same class of objects. And part of my goal in here is to understand relationships between data, to understand what is the relationship between this image and this scan, and what is the relationship between this skyscraper and this skyscraper. So the main point I want to make is that we can do better if we analyze data, not individually, but collectively. That every operation we do on a piece of data can be informed and improved if we understand the social network, the society that this data is part of. And I show here an example where what I'm showing is the act of segmenting a human 3D model. And many, many segmentation algorithms have trouble in getting the human neck because the human neck is a fairly small part of the anatomy of a human. But if we are segmenting humans, not alone, but in the context of, say, other mammals, like horses and donkeys and dogs and giraffes that have very prominent necks, and if we can understand how the horse neck somehow corresponds to the human neck, how the anatomy of the horse corresponds to the anatomy of the human, Maybe then we will not miss the human neck because the horse and the dog and the giraffe will tell the human, your neck is important. How this communication happens between the data is the main point of this talk. So here is then the framework I'm going to talk about, joint data analysis. The idea is as we get more and more data about the world, this data becomes more and more interconnected and intertwined because we are capturing the same data multiple times. We see photographs of the same object, scans of the same object, because there are naturally similarities and relationships in the world. I mean, all humans have roughly the same structure. Many cars are the same. Uh, so there's natural hierarchies, even as I mentioned, you know, animals and humans have shared structure. Or because there is many symmetries and repetitions in the world. You know, in this room, there's many, many chairs that are copies of each other. If you look in the roof, you see many regular patterns. All these repetitions that are present in the real world become structure that can be extracted when we look at data and can help us understand what the data is about. So I want to think about building networks, as I mentioned. We can think about social networks, but they're not social networks between people. They're social networks between data captured from real world objects. So somehow, every piece of data does not live alone, but has a social context, a social network of friends, of peer objects, of partner objects, and understanding those relationships with the peers and the partners can be very helpful in, in understanding the data about the object itself. How? One example is what I said, namely, any operation you can do on one piece of data, you can validate by looking at how the same operation would have been performed in the peers or partners of the subject, as I showed in the segmentation case. And, and as we'll see also later on in the talk, uh, establishing the relationship between objects can itself be helped by the network because every relation can be assessed against other relations. So somehow, the key point here is that this network I'm talking about becomes the great regularizer in everything we do with data 
We don't do things in isolation, we do things in the context of many other things like us. And ultimately, I also hope to show you today how as you build these networks, structure emerges from the data. In this case, the map of a city can emerge out of GPS traces of the city. So the semantic structure, higher level entities, can emerge out of very low level sensor data. So that's the big plan for the talk. Now, the key building block to make this happen is to find atomic relationships between data pairs. And I show here mostly these relationships in the context of 3D shapes, but you can imagine also the same thing for images or for GPS traces and for many other kinds of data. And this can be mappings at many levels of detail. They can be at the point level or the pixel level for images when you have very similar objects. I mean, you know, two humans, perhaps for every point on my body, I can find a corresponding point on Soata's body, maybe not, I don't know. Uh, but then when you have less similar objects like a, like a human and a horse, maybe you can still correspond limbs, although you cannot correspond points because humans have toes and horses have hoofs. But somehow the goal here is to represent mapping correspondences at multiple levels of detail. And really the, the, the main sort of technical meat of this talk is how to represent mappings. It's somehow obvious that we need to represent shapes or images, but now I want to represent somehow again, as I said, the space between the objects, the space between the images, to find representations between mapping, between objects, find relations between objects and make them concrete, storable, searchable, indexable objects. And then I want to be able to start doing second order comparisons. Not to compare objects, but to compare relationships between objects. So I want to be able to say, for example, that the relationship of these two uh, bones is similar to the relationship of these two brains, but not the relationship of these two teeth. Somehow the relationship should make sense as individual objects, even though the actual objects being related disappear. The teeth can disappear, but the relationship between them still exists as an object. That is what I want to create. And part of the reason we want to have these relationships or mapping is because we can transport information from one piece of data to another. And of course, in computer graphics, this is very common because we can use mappings between 3D models to transport texture and parameterization, <coughs> segmentation and labels, transport the formations and so on. But we'll see many more uses of this idea. So part of what we are doing here is uh, building a transportation network. The same way that you have cities and roads and cars transporting goods, in our case, there'll be things sitting on the edges of this network that transport information between the data that the edge joins. And that is part of the power that comes from these networks. Now, to accomplish this, I'm going to have to take a somewhat strange uh, point of view. Instead of thinking about the data directly, instead of thinking about pixels in the images or triangles in the case of a 3D model, I'm going to think dually. I'm going to think of functions living on this. Functions on the pixels, functions on the mesh. You can think of attributes, of properties, of descriptions, of opinions, of recommendations, all as being things that live on in such a functional space. And those are the things I'm, I'm going to map. I will not map the objects themselves. I will map function spaces over the objects. That is a key uh, change we will see. And I'll be interested also in things that map functions to functions. I'll call these operators. Uh, and specifically, I'll make some use of something that's the analog of the Fourier operator in normal analysis, the Laplace Beltrami operator on, on a manifold. And that comes out of the solution of the heat equation, one of the P, natural PDEs on, on, on manifolds, and whose eigenfunctions capture nice structure about a shape. Uh, in the image domain, for example, shift flow can be thought of as another um, such operator that maps uh, RGB values to shift values. And so, to summarize, before I start getting somewhat technical, somehow the grand goal here is, right, to compare everything to everything and summarize 
this comparison. So of course, that's, that's a big, big problem. That's a big issue because you have you know, this n square of pairs, and it's very expensive to compare everything to everything. That's one challenge. How do you do all these comparisons? But also, these comparisons are not independent, right? I mean, if I tell you that uh, in this uh, set of chairs, this, uh, you know, the base of the right front leg corresponds in this chair to this and in this chair to that, it follows retrospectivity that this also corresponds. And, uh, you know, you all know about Euclid and the elements, and uh, Euclid's elements actually at the very beginning have in addition to the famous axioms you all know about, something else that Euclid calls common notions. And one of these common notions is that two things that are the same as something else are themselves the same. Transitivity of equality. And this means that these relationships that we are interested in have many, many interdependencies. They are not independent objects. How to disentangle to find essentially what is the independent information in this network? of relationships is part of what we have to do. And of course, finally, not all the relationships are equally you know, important. We have to understand which relationships are the most important for us as humans in understanding this data and which ones help a particular task. Okay, so this is the uh, basic philosophy, the basic plan behind this work. And uh, I want to say, in a couple of places in the talk, there'll be something where you take an uncommon perspective on something common. I show here the, one of these famous uh, images that some of you may see as a girl looking away from the, from the uh, screen, and some of you may see as an old woman facing to the side. And I think actually, if you see one of these, you have to really stretch your brain to see the other. The brain, once it commits to an interpretation, doesn't like to switch. And I'll point out these places where I'm, I'm kind of looking at something common, but switching to viewing it in an uncommon way. And the first part is this. I'll talk about correspondences or maps by looking at the dual object. So I'll take what you can think of as a traditional correspondence, say, between these two cat models that you could visualize as, you know, tip of the ear goes to tip of the ear and, you know, left uh, front toe goes to left front toe and so on into something that is mathematically nicer, like a matrix. So the idea is this, does. let's say we have this lion model and this cat model, and we have a correspondence of the traditional kind from the lion to the cat. So we can say that you know, the, the tip of the right ear corresponds to the tip of the right ear, and the end of the tail to correspond to the end of the tail, and so on. Then this correspondence lets us generate maps of functions living on these two objects going the other way. For example, I can take uh, this coloring of the cat, which simply indicates x-coordinate, high here, low here, and simply transport it to the lion, because for every lion point, I can find a corresponding cat point and color it by the cat function. And I can transport many different functions. If I, I can transport any function this way by simply this pullback operation. So mathematically, I have what is a contravariant functor, that is, I can take a map from a, uh, from a cow to a horse at the point level and generate a function, a, a mapping from functions of the horse to functions of the cow. And the space of all functions of the horse is a linear space, and so is the space of all functions of the cow. And it's trivial to check that this mapping I generate by lifting phi to this functional space is actually a linear operator. And that is one of the key things I want to exploit in this talk. It's also possible to go back, to go from the linear operator to the, to the initial map, but I will not discuss this, it's too lack of time. Uh, and so this is sort of the operator view of maps, that instead of thinking of a correspondence at the point level, you think of this matrix that maps functions on one object to functions on the other object. And many nice things fall out of this framework. Uh, first of all, the functional maps are much more general than point-to-point -point maps. They can encode traditional point-to-point -point maps, but they can also encode more general maps. For example, maybe sometimes we are not certain about what the mapping should do. There can be ambiguities, say, because of symmetry. If I, if I map a human to a human, maybe I'm not sure if the left goes to the left or the left goes to the right, because, symmetries have, because humans have left-to-right symmetry. 
representing this ambiguity is trivial in, in a functional setting because I can map a delta function on this point to what is half a delta function on the left and half a delta function on the right. And as I, as I was showing earlier, I can use some functional basis to represent the functional space, and, I, and it makes sense to use the Laplace Beltrami eigen function. This is like the Fourier functions, or, or say, you or say, you spherical harmonics on the sphere, because it's a hierarchical basis. It captures the most important variations in the early coefficients, and I can truncate and ignore some detail, which also buys me some, some robustness to noise. And therefore, I can write down these functional maps as matrices, and then uh, composition of correspondences or transformations just becomes matrix multiplication. Furthermore, for related shapes, like I show here, very often these maps are very sparse because you preserve structure as you map. And here I show the case of mapping this cut to three other cuts using the direct obvious map when the map is mostly diagonal. There's still some noise because I have truncated the bases. This is the symmetric map when I flip left and right, still very, very sparse. And this is a strange map when I map the head, as you can see from the color to the tail. And this is much less sparse, as you can see. And uh, the same way that you can think about correspondences at the point level, we can think of correspondences at the function level. That is, I can say, OK, I'm going to map the shapes, and I'm going to have the property that the curvature, say, function on the shape maps to the curvature function on that shape. And since we have this nice basis, one thing we can say is I want, say, the Laplace Beltrami eigen functions of the left shape to correspond to the Laplace Beltrami functions of the right shape. And in general, I mean, function to function correspondences are just as natural as point to point correspondences. And if we take this point of view, then we realize that what I've been talking about is not just a way to represent maps, it's actually a way to compute maps. Because to compute a map, I just have to give a number. I'm trying to estimate a matrix, and a known matrix that satisfies a number of correspondence constraints takes this function to this function, and that function to that function, and that function to that function, and so on. And a lot of things can be encoded as properties like that, not just a descriptor like curvature, but also, for example, if I want to map my left hand to Suato's left hand, well, the, my left hand is a 0, 1 function on me, and Stefano's left arm is also, is also a 0, 1 function on Stefano's body, so I can just say map this function on my body to the corresponding function on Stefano's body. So you can give many, many natural constraints. Also, I mean, point-to-point -point constraints are a special case. I can think of a landmark correspondence as a, as a delta function correspondence, or maybe I take the function which is distance to this point, and I say it has to correspond to the distance function to the corresponding point on the other side. And so all these things become essentially a regularized linear system that we can solve with traditional uh, kind of least squares techniques. And so the main point about going to this dual space is that we get linear algebra. And it's a bit like the, the, uh, the kernel trick you know, in machine learning, that by going to a much higher space, we buy linearity. And now, actually, it is true that the space of functional maps is much, much larger than the space of point-to-point -point maps, and so there can be many monsters that live in that space we would like to ostracize, we would like not to get. And so we want to throw in also various regularizers. And it turns out that with appropriate regularizers, even very few constraints, every, very few functional maps su suffice. For example, when I was mapping the scats or 3D shapes in general of, say, like organic forms like animals or humans, Typically, you want isometric mappings because the deformation is nearly isometric. It turns out isometry here can be expressed simply as commutation with the corresponding Laplacian operator on the two manifolds. So that's a linear constraint because delta, the deltas are known operators and the C is the unknown. Uh, symmetry, I can say you preserve symmetry in the mapping. That's again a linear constraint. Many, many natural constraints become just again part of the linear system. And even some nonlinear constraints can be imposed using various techniques, which due to lack of time I will not discuss. For example, you know, area volume preservation that corresponds to the normality of the corresponding map. All these promote point-to-pointness in the setting of functional maps. And this then becomes a very nice way, a very inexpensive way to compute correspondences between shapes that is competitive and in many ways superior to state-of-the-art uh, methods. This example shows something derived with only 10 probe functions, 
plus one part correspondence because I'm comparing, in this case, mostly animal or human forms where they always have a left to right symmetry. So there is the ambiguity I have to resolve. So I'm going to now try to use this machinery to do something that's more interesting than just computing maps, namely to derive a precise notion of the difference between two shapes. Let's consider those two faces I show there and ask how are they different? Well, they're different in many ways, right? I mean, you can compare nose lengths, spacing of the eyes, I don't know, symmetry of the ears, you name it. Which one of those should I compare? Well, part of the reason we have so many shape difference notions is because there are really many, many ways to compare two shapes. And one thing I wanted to accomplish here is to get a universal comparator, something that in it in includes all possible comparisons. I want like the same concept as a universal Turing machine. I want to build an object that is not itself a difference, but when you tell it what difference you want, it gives you the exact answer. And this object exists by itself irrespective of the two things that it differenced. The same way as, you, as, you, as when you subtract two numbers, you get a number. This number exists irrespective of the two numbers that you differenced. And uh, I'll focus right now on understanding intrinsic distortions, things that ignore the embedding of the shape into 3D, and there is various notions of that, area distortion, angle or conformal distortion, and again, due to lack of time, I'll focus in the remaining slides on this topic in area distortion. Uh, now, normally the way you would approach this from a differential geometric point of view is to look at what happens at unit tangent vectors on the surface and how the inner product between them changes as you transport them under the map, and that's the Riemannian view. But of course, we are uh, focused on functions here. So the corresponding thing is to measure distortions. It's not to track how inner products of, fun of vectors change, but how inner products of functions change. And to do so, basically, I given, say, a map between two shapes or two manifolds, uh, M and N, shown here. I have some notion of inner product on M, and that defines my measurement on the first uh, surface. And uh, then I transport these functions over by the functional map capital F, and I compute the inner product on the range surface, and that gives me some other value. You can, if you don't see immediately the connection between this notion of measurement and the original, think about, say, measuring the distance between Riemann's eyes. You can imagine putting two Gaussians one on each eye, and then the correlation of these two Gaussians is a measure of how close Riemann's eyes are. So I'm going to measure distortions by seeing what happens to the inner products under the map. And uh, well, here are some facts. Uh, if I have an area-preserving map, then actually that's equivalent to preserving this inner product. So I can try to, in general, think about the difference between these two inner products as the distortion caused by the map, as measured by my specific functions, f and g. But now notice the following. I'm measuring something on the cat, on the, on the, on the domain, by computing the inner product on the domain. Or I'm measuring it by transporting the functions over to the lion, and then computing the inner product on the lion, but really this is just another inner product oops, uh, on, the, on two cut functions. So I'm just dealing with two different inner products on or functions on the cut. And uh, what happens is that there's a classic theorem of function analysis called the disrepresentation theorem that says any two such inner products are related by a linear operator, this V. Uh, and what this V does is to compensate. Effectively, before I computed the product, it was different on the lion and the cat. But after on the cat, I compensate for on one of the functions via this operator v, they become the same. And the really impressive and surprising thing about Riemann, this, um, this, uh, this Ries theorem is that this compensation does not depend on the measurement. This works the same v works for all f and g. That is the universality of the compensation. And that's why I want to call this v my shape difference. Uh, intuitively, you can see an example here. I take a sphere, 
and I make an, a little bump on it. Well, a function like g that doesn't, uh, is not affected by the uh, bump, does not have to be compensated. But a function that lives right where the bump happens has to be compensated. Okay? That is what V does. It, 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 it takes functions on one shape and changes them so that when I compute inner products on the, on the original shape, I get the same effect as if transporting the functions over to the other shape and then computing the inner product. So again, this is sort of an operator view because I have a functional map that itself is a linear operator. And then from that, I can get another linear operator that now maps the domain space to itself, maps the cut functional space to itself. That is the, what I call the, you know, the area-based difference, and it's a corresponding thing that I, I will not discuss called the conformal uh, shape difference. And actually, you get all that you want in this case, namely, if this difference is the identity, then the, the map is, co is, is in the V case, point-wise area preserving, in the R case, point-wise conformal, and if both are true, there is an isometry. And also, if you have two maps that have the same difference operator, then one times the inverse of the other is essentially the identity as far as you know, namely, it's an area preserving, and similarly, F1 minus, minus 1G is conformal. So essentially, these differences are fully informal, informative within the domain of the transformation group that does not change the difference. So let's look, let's look at, some, at some examples now, how we can use this notion of shape difference to analyze shape collections. Here I want to compare differences from one shape M to two other shapes, uh, N1 and N2. And actually I can do this nicely because the difference operator I defined is a self-map of M. So the, both the difference of M to N1 and M to N2 live on the same domain and have the same range so they can be compared. But I can actually even compare things when things are not the same. For example, say I want to compare, in this case, uh, the difference between M and N to the difference between P and Q. I can't do this directly because this difference is something that lives on the functional space of P, and this difference lives on the functional space of M, but <coughs> What I can do is transport one to the other, which really corresponds to a change of basis. I can use a map between M and P to transport, essentially. Uh, I, can go, I, can, I can go from C, then apply the same difference at the um, P level, and then go back to M. So I get something which now lives on M. I start on M, I move down to P, I, I apply the shape difference and I go back to M, so I can compare these two differences. It's like exchange of currency, you know, I've crossed the border and I have to change, I don't know, my euros to pounds. And actually, it's surprising, but it's also possible to do some comparison between differences when there's no connection, when the network is fully disconnected, because the transport operation for the shape difference is matrix conjugation, that means the spectrum is preserved. So I can still compare in this case, and then to PQ by comparing not directly the maps because I don't know the, co the change of basis that I have to do, but I can compare the spectra. It's, it's a weaker form of comparison, but still meaningful. Let me show you some examples of this. Here is a trivial example of, of having artificial sphere that grows two horns. And what I do here is I, is I take all the shape differences between the undeformed sphere, which is somewhere in the middle, no, it's up there, and all the other spheres, and, and I view them as vectors, and then I do PCA on these vectors, and it turns out all the variability is captured by the, by the first two components, and both in the area and conformal case, I recover both the pattern and also where the deformations happen. Here's an example of something that's slightly more interesting. Here I am looking at the deformations of a galloping horse, and here is my base horse. Every other horse is encoded by the shape difference to the base horse, and all the shape difference again I, they are matrices, I think of them as points in high dimensional space, I do PCA of them, and again I capture everything, essentially, by the first two dimensions. And here I see very clearly that I have a circular pattern in the galloping of the horse. I go around and around. And here I show that in both the area case and the conformal case, and where these distortions happen, because you know, the, the legs is what is moving. 
Uh, I can also do more localized comparisons. I can define a region of interest where I want to see what the difference is. And I can clip, essentially, the shape difference to only look at that area. And then I can say, OK, given, say, how this human is different from this human in this area, find other humans that exaggerate this difference. And this will find other pods of this human where the knee is even more bent. This is all from the scape database. Here I look at how the shoulder area changes as I lift my arm, and I find things that exaggerate this difference. Here is the guy with lifting his arm even more. These are essentially ranked among all these models database, the ones that are most exaggerated in the, in the direction given by this difference. I can also do shape analogies. Given shapes A, B, and C, I want to find a shape D that has this, a difference to C that is as close as possible to the difference of B to A. So I want to search the database to find this uh, D that has the most similar difference from A to B. And uh, you can see this works quite well. And now I'm doing something which is clearly second order. I'm not comparing shapes. I'm comparing differences of shapes, as I was saying earlier. And one can go even to the setting where I don't have any correspondences between the shapes. Here I have two collections of faces. Fa Phase A and phase B, they have corresponding poses. I'm going to find the correspondence between the poses, but I don't have any map between the faces. So what I do is I just compute shape differences between variants of the same face where I have the map, and I get a complete graph. And then I can decorate the edges of this graph by the corresponding spectra of the operators, and then do a graph matching algorithm that tries to find the permutation that best aligns this thing, and this works. So I was able to align these poses of the two faces without any cross map between the shapes. That means the representations of the shapes could have been completely different. I never compared the shapes directly. I only compared their differences. So in this discussion, in addition to the differences, we started seeing something new. We started seeing differences of more than two things, or maps between more than two things appearing. And this really is the central theme. I want to think about not just two things, but networks. And here's an example of a small network of human shapes and maps between them. These are networks of samenesses between the data. I'm trying to encode what is the same or different, or, or to differentiate what is the same and different as I go across. And the way I'm doing that, as you saw, is by doing something algebraic. I am replacing every 3D shape by a vector space that represents functions over that shape, and I'm replacing every map between the shapes by, by a linear operator, which is the linear map that transforms one vector space to another. And this is, of course, something that is very familiar from algebraic topology or homological algebra. Now, one thing I want to make clear is that many people build networks of images or networks of shapes that are graphs, and they, and they encode the edges with some similarity score. But when you have maps, you have a lot more information. Think about this small example of those three artificial images, whatever. Here, this differs from this by half, and this differs from this by half, and this differs from this by half, and this differs from this by half. But this is completely different from this, and this is completely the same as this. At the level of differences, at the level of distances between images or shapes, you will never see the difference between the top row and the bottom row. But at the level of maps, you see the difference. Because you know more. You know about what part corresponds to what part. You know that this thing is preserved here, and it's not preserved here. Nothing is preserved here across the three shapes. So what I'm talking about comes back to my title, a functorial view of data. This is the view that when understanding mathematical spaces, and I claim the same thing is true when you look at the data, understanding the maps between the spaces, the maps between the data, is just as important as understanding the data themselves. And this is, of course, the viewpoint of homological algebra, that the information really is in, is in the maps between the shapes or the images and so on. Uh, however, it is not completely the same as this traditional mathematical point of view, because in algebraic topology and homological algebra, these maps are coming typically from canonical constructions, and then you prove commutativity of the diagram. In our case, there's a very strong statistical or machine learning flavor because the maps have to be estimated. And then this commutativity of the diagram or path invariance or cycle closure along the network becomes 
regularizer of the maps. In fact, it's a very strong condition. Uh, because if we think of a big matrix whose IJ entry, or block, sorry, IJ block, is a matrix itself that shows how to map, say, say pi to shape j or image i to shape j. If, this, if all these maps are consistent, meaning the network has full cycle closure, composing maps along any cycle gives me the identity, then this map has to be very, then this matrix has to be very low rank. The reason is, why? Well, think of this, instead of thinking of these maps between the shapes, think about the logarithms of these maps. It's not precise what I'm saying, just, just an intuition. Then composing along a cycle corresponds to adding the logarithms. If all compositions along cycles give you the identity, all sums of logarithms along cycles give you zero. That means the entries of these log matrices are very highly linearly dependent. So there's many, many, many linear uh, 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 relationships if there is consistency in the system, and that means the matrix has low rank. So I'm going to illustrate this idea by giving an example from the image world now, where I'm going to try to segment common portions out of images. I'll do what in computer vision is called image co-segmentation, where I give you, say, multiple views of the same object or views of similar objects, and I try to extract that common object. And again, this also works for shapes, and I'll show some examples from the shape, shape world. And again, the interesting question is, how do the different images help each other? How does this cow image help you find the cow in this image? That is what I'm interested in. And again, I'll build a network. In this case, I build the network as follows. If I have few images, like less than 30, I build the complete graph. If I have many and many, it's not so many, maybe 100 or something, then I build a sparser graph by connecting every image to its 30 nearest neighbors according to the just image uh, similarity metric. This is very rough and probably like one can do much better, but it's something, some way to get a sparse network. Okay, now, again, for efficiency reasons, instead of thinking of functions on the uh, pixels, I'll, I'm going to try to build something coarser. I'm going to replace every image by its super pixel decomposition. So I replace every image by 200 super pixels. And then I think of the dual graph of this super pixel partition, and I'm going to think of functions living on this graph. I show such functions here, and then I'm going to develop maps between these functions on graphs that try to preserve shared structure, and somehow out of that, I will get the segmentation of the objects. Okay, so this is sort of the pipeline. Build the super pixel graph representation of, of the images, uh, express functions over these graphs in terms of the eigenvectors of the Laplacian, which corresponds exactly to, the, to what I did for the shapes, where I had the Laplace Beltrami operator and its eigenfunctions. Then estimate maps along the network edges that both preserve image features and are cycle consistent in the way I was just describing. And then somehow look at those functions that are most consistently transported by the network. And, and then the common object should arise <laughs> out of these functions. And in slightly more detail, here's how this works. So again, every graph becomes, uh, uh, I mean, every image becomes, uh, is decomposed into 200 super pixels. And I, I, I get a graph, which is the dual graph of the super pixels, and every edge is weighted by the length of the shared boundary between the two super pixels. And now I represent functions over these graphs by um, building a functional space and taking the eigenvectors of the Laplacian. And it turns out, because we are looking at fairly large objects, we can use pretty coarse bases. So 30 of these eigenvectors, the top 30 eigenvectors, do a pretty good job of reconstructing indicator functions of cows which, or objects which is our application, and you know, we sort of have graphs that illustrate the effect of changing the number of bases. And now, here comes the fun part. Before I was estimating the, fi the, the uh, functional maps between every pair, but now I will simultaneously estimate functional maps between pairs of images and try to enforce the global consistency of the functional maps. And the pairwise comparison or term so I'm going to estimate, oops, uh, sorry, uh, matrices, this mapping matrix XIJ that transport descriptors from one image to the corresponding descriptors of the other image. 
That's what I call the you know, prop functions in the shape case, and I call them prop functions also here. Um, and the specific features we used in this work are very traditional computer vision features, namely RGB color and RGB color histograms and bag of words based on the shift features. And then the circularization term that tries to make the maps more diagonal for similar images, the pair selected by the GIST descriptor by basically saying that the eigenvectors of the image on the left should correspond to eigenvectors of the image on the right with roughly similar eigenvalue. And here is the most interesting constraint, and that's again one of these uh, twist your mind kinds of situations, the, the consistency. How to express that? Because this is tricky, right? I mean, first of all, there is many, many cycles in the graph, and which cycles do I choose? Like, you know, the, the number of cycles is exponential. Second, if I start composing this matrix along the cycles, I get products of entries. This is highly nonlinear. How am I going to do that? I'm going to you know, go around three, even if I just take you know, three cycles, I'll get products of three matrices, which is a cubic. So the whole thing starts to look hopeless. But there is a, a way to get around this, which comes from Plato. That's why I talked about the Republic at the beginning. Because it's, you see, if the assumption here is that all these images have some, something in common. And that something in common is maybe the platonic ideal of this common object. And so maybe what we can think about is maps between the actual cows and this platonic cow, which we don't know. But if we have a way to build these maps with the platonic cow, and if this image to image map factorizes by the platonic cow, so basically xij is roughly the same as yj inverse composed with yi that is going this way, is the same as going this way, then for every cycle, commutativity or closure comes for free. Because going around the cycle, we simply get telescoping products. We get this this way, 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 this this way. So everything cancels. Now, of course, these are not the same cow. You don't expect everything to cancel. So in this setting, as I mentioned, every image becomes a vector space of dimension 30. So the cross image maps are 30 by 30 linear operators or matrices. But here we'll say that for the platonic cow, there's some information loss because not all these images are the same. So we'll make the y maps be 30 by 20. Only, so basically we want these vector spaces over the individual images to have only a 20-dimensional subspace that's common. Also because these images are not just the cow, they contain backgrounds that are different, and we have to capture that. So we can throw everything together into a big optimization that involves the sum of all these different energies we define. Now the sad thing is, this is not a convex problem, but in practice it can be solved efficiently using alternating optimization as follows. If you assume that I know the Y maps, the maps to the, plato to the platonic object, then solving for the X's becomes just local independent quadratic programming problems. And these are not so big, so these are no problem. And then if you assume that you know the cross maps, the XIJs, then solving for the Y's becomes a standard eigenvalue problem. And uh, again, this is more expensive now because this is, global. this is global, this couples the system, but it's doable. And out of that come the maps come these blue boxes that show the how to map between the images in a way that is most consistent according to this network. And here's an example of the maps that you get. And again, don't think about pixel-to-pixel -pixel map. We just operate with these coarse representations. And I show here an example of here is the super pixel view of this cow. Every superpixel is colored by its average RGB color, and then I compute the functional map in the way I indicated to this other cow, and I transport the colors of this cow to the other cow. And you can see it's very coarse, but it captures roughly where the other cow is. In fact, you can see also that parts get transported consistently here. The upper part of the body of the gymnast is transported correctly, and so is the lower part. Once we have these functional maps, the ultimate goal, of course, is to produce segmentations. And now, what we are trying to find is functions living on, on its image that do two things. One is 
are coherently transported by the network, and B, agree with normal classical computer vision segmentation cues, like graph cuts. And again, we can throw this into an optimization problem that combines these two terms, the consistency of the maps here and the uh, local segmentation quality. And again, this becomes an again the composition problem that can be solved, and that is how we approach the problem. And now I want to show you that this is another view of the network. Essentially, here the network has given us a set of equations, right? It says whatever is important here has to be consistent with whatever is important there transported to me. Whatever I think is the cow should agree with whatever my neighbor's thing is the cow after that cow is transported to me by this consistent operators we derived from the network. And again, we try to, so we tried this on a number of standard uh, computer vision data sets, and it does you know, quite well, even the unsupervised, I mean, this method is completely unsupervised, and it already does, in several cases, quite a bit better than supervised methods. And of course, supervision can be added by saying, on this image, this has to be the function that you will get. This is the cow function on the image, and I think I'll just uh, show you some, some example images of this. Again, this is using very small data sets, and you know, the orange is the segmentation of the common object obtained. And it's not perfect, as you can see, but it does quite well. And it does so even with very high diversity between the images. I mean, look at these dogs. You know, these are very different images. And also we have extension of this work now that deals with the much harder problem of images that contain not only one type of object, but multiple types of objects. And of course, this is quite a bit more challenging because we have to simultaneously solve both a combinatorial problem and a, a continuous problem. Namely, we have to estimate what are the objects present in the image and where they are. And I think in the interest of time, um, I need to finish. So let me not say anything about the method. Let me show some, some examples uh, shown here by the different colors superimposed on the objects. So to wrap up this part of the talk, I think the interesting thing that happened here is to see structure emerging directly from the data where somehow out of the uh, cow images, we derive this this universal cow object. This cow object is not a cow. I mean, it's not a 3D model of a cow. It's not an image of a cow. It's just a vector space where all these other images or, or, or image vector spaces can be mapped so they agree. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you know any category theory, you may think of this as the limit of all these vector spaces. It's something that, when you think of mapping a cow to something that is a very distant, but somehow related, like a table. It has four legs. You can factorize the map through the collimit without loss. Basically, this shared vector space has all that's in common with a table that any cow has with a table. OK, I think I'm out of time and I have gone over. I'm sorry. So I'll skip some of these other newer things on doing segmentation of shapes, also on trying to. Uh, use mixed networks of shapes and images and transport information from shapes to images. Let me skip that and come back to uh, my story about uh, Marco Polo, because actually it's kind of interesting. The first half of the book is Marco Polo describing to Kublai Khan all these fantastic cities that are very, very different uh, that he saw during his many, many years of travels. But, but, but at some point he tells the Kublai Khan, that actually these are all the same. These are all Venice. These are all different views of Venice. These are all actually views of the same thing. And I think that's partly what, I mean, why I chose this, because I think what's going on here is that we are finding the sameness in a group. I mean, all of you are familiar with, I don't know, your, your run with your Kinect takes 3D scans and glue them together, doing slum. This is doing slum at the level of abstractions, not at the level of real things, but still, I think that's interesting. And to finish, so I just wanted to focus on this idea of factoriality, that if you think of classical machine learning, you have very much a vertical view that you start with signals and you extract low-level features and aggregate those into higher-level features and so on until semantic things come out. 
And you notice that I'm taking a horizontal view. I'm not going up, I'm going to the sides. I am connecting low-level things to other similar low-level things, but then somehow reasoning over the entire network to understand which of these connections to trust and which not. And somehow the consistent stuff that emerges out of these networks also seems to capture something that is semantically important. Uh, so uh, I'll finish here. I want to thank my several collaborators in this work that include both current and past students, as, as well as some senior people, also my funding sponsors. And uh, as a last teaser, I don't have to go into this, we're also playing with ideas in the space of homeworks. We're trying to build networks of homeworks so that a few human graders can give meaningful annotations to people take, to, to 10,000 students taking a MOOC. This is the network that comes out of Andrew Eng's machine learning class, the second time it was given. This is about uh, 10,000, no, 40,000 students and 1 million homeworks. And basically what this tries to exploit is the fact that if you have 10,000 students, you probably don't have 10,000 different ways that you solve the problem wrong. That the, the human mind follows certain patterns, makes certain common errors, and then the network somehow discovers the common errors. So, Anyway, I'm going to stop here. Sorry that I went over time. on the maps and uh, talk about distributions on them as opposed to having one instance of atomic cow being the one that then is mapped or whose functions are Right. I have, I can give another hour to talk about this. <laughs> um, right, I mean this is a very simplistic scenario. Um, right, and uh, of course not all cows are the same and one can make fine distinctions between different cow species, so maybe as an example, let's think about say having pictures of cows and sheep. And maybe in this platonic ideal, we would get not one, but a hierarchy. We would get the mammal ideal that includes both the cow and the sheep, and then there would be the, the, uh, the, uh, the cow node that encodes what is different between the actual cow images and the general ideal of the mammal, and then the sheep node that encodes what is different in, in there. And, uh, um, but it, it is, so the, the abstraction network that allows you to explain the relations between the images does not have to be a single node. This is missing, it can be some, some, some other network that you put there. Uh, in my view, this is the, okay. In neural networks, there's a combination of linear steps and nonlinear steps and Somehow the muddling happens because of the nonlinear steps. Here, this is the nonlinearity. When you commit to certain discrete structure, this now brings compactness and so on. And I think that in addition to des describing this vector space that's shared, one can imagine also describing the variability present in the data that also fits a, a linear type of model. So one could have, indeed, a representation of some basic discrete structure on top of which sits some continuous thing. I mean, you all know about kind of mixtures of Gaussians. This could be a, a combinatorial network of vector spaces with some variability, you know, covariance spaces sitting on top of them, which might correspond to what Suato and Stefano had in mind. But this is just fantasy right now. I, mean, I haven't done any of this. Yes. How do you take care of the, the, the Sorry? things of three-dimensional? We are, we are in, a, in a three dimensional world. The cow yeah. is not a picture. It's not a picture. The cow is a cow. So if you fit just pictures and you don't say this is cow from different angles, how can you get around the Because that is the most the world of two dimensional to three dimensional. Well, this thing lives in 
you know, 30 and 20 dimensions, that doesn't know anything about 2D or 3D. Again, I'm not looking at the physical space. I'm looking at the dual space of properties. I am analyzing functions on the image and functions, right? So I'm looking at color and shift fixtures or whatever. So I never look at the dimensionality of the underlying reality. I just look at the dimensionality of the space of properties. So it's a little bit counterintuitive in that respect. But I don't build a 3D model, I don't build an image, I just build a shared vector space of properties that these images um, have in common. Um, and I think in some sense, I mean, what's going on, to give you a more down-to-earth answer, is that, you know, people have looked at building shape abstractions that are themselves 3D models, and I think it's difficult. It's difficult because in my case, I can do linear algebraic things exactly because the object I'm constructing does not have to correspond to a real object. But still a useful object because I can compare it to a real object. For example, I can compute a mean shape as a vector space and compare it to a real shape. But if you try to compute a mean shape as a 3D object, there's many, many kinds of pitfalls in this because the space of shape is not linear. Yes? Leo, can, can you use this uh, mathematical machinery functional blend. Uh, are you familiar with the, uh, the chair, for example, that's in the shape of a lady's high heel shoe? Uh -huh. Or other, other objects like a, a, a mug that is in the shape of a human skull. But these have to be functional merges of, of shapes. In other words, <coughs> the chair has to work as a chair. The mug has to be, right. has to be able to contain fluid. So one of my PhD students, Noah Duncan, I don't know if he's in, there he is, yeah. He's developed this uh, semi-automated um, algorithm that could actually take two shapes, uh, like a horse and a table, and create a table horse, or a table chair. Okay. Uh, and I'm wondering if, uh, if this mathematics would be able to... Uh, perhaps, I mean, perhaps. Uh, uh, Again, you would have to figure out some way to find, I mean. Can you say what part of the shape, for example, is the functional part? You know, like if it's a chair, that it has to be like a horizontal surface, maybe with a back, maybe with arms. And those are fundamental to that particular shape. Right, the way that would fit into this formulation is by defining, again, now it gets confusing because we, we, we're using functional in two different senses. Yeah. There is functional in the sense of how a shape is used. Yes. I am sitting on this table. And there is functional in the sense I was using in the talk, which is functions defined over the shape. Not, not but I think they're related. That is, you can define certain functions that capture the, in my sense, that capture the functionality in your sense. And then you want to be sure that these functions are well preserved. They're the important functions, the ones that define what the shape is. And try to make sure that whatever is the transport, it does very well on these on this crucial functions and tries to preserve them. So there's uh, certain ways where you can blend, where you can blend two uh, shapes like that, and others where you kind of cut and paste. Have you ever seen this full size, full size statue of a horse with a uh, lampshade coming out of its head? It's actually a, a lamp, but it's a full size horse lamp with just a, a lampshade plus a, a light bulb right. coming out of its head. Right. You see that I've seen it in, in, in one or two hotels, actually. I have played around a little bit on, in this direction of trying to create real shapes using objectives coming from this world. But I want to make sure that you understand that right now, what I create is not real objects. I create fictions. I create vector spaces that capture certain things. And there is things to be understood in how you go from this to a realization of this as a, as a real object, either as a 3D shape or as an image. This is not trivial because you have to preserve more structure to make the thing a real 3D object, and there can be obstacles in this. Uh, but definitely, the importance of functionality, I mean, one, for example, one way to derive interesting functions for a shape is to figure out how a human touches and uses the shape. So, the, so, so you know, the affordances of a shape can definitely be mapped into the functional framework, and they can be used. For example, I can say that a couch corresponds to a chair, even though kind of geometrically they're very different, 
because the same, there's a correspondence between parts that are the same in terms of what they come in contact with, with the human body. So via the partner again, so the network now is couch to human to chair, and, and the human is what tells you what makes the couch and the chair the same. Again, this is at the level of analyzing relationships. And I think Dimitri is talking about the more exciting and more interesting problem of creating new geometry or new images that somehow blend the relationships. And this is open. Yes, Mario. At the beginning, at the beginning you showed the, the human body and the animal, right. the animal so you got the neck, the head. Right. So. Is there a concept in Plato of a, instead of a horse or a cow, maybe the leg or the toe or the eye? In other words, then uh, can you s set up a network that connects uh, these uh, elementary segments of... Uh, well, I don't, I don't think no. Plato has anything about this in his writings, but, uh, but, uh, but structure, I mean, the structure of parts emerges from a network. Uh, maybe I had an example I didn't quite have time to show. So the cow is a superposition of networks. One network for the toe, one network for the leg. Or no, and no. sorry, I don't have a good example here to show, but um, if, I, if I take a set of chairs that are very diverse, then I can actually discover chair parts by comparing the shape. So the notion of parts like the back or the, or the, or the seat or the base emerges from the data, okay? Uh, and so I can do consistent segmentation like I show here. I, I, you know, because for example, if you think of a human body, if I have my leg bent, almost all algorithms can will want to, b to make this into two parts. If I have it straight, then, then I have one part. But if I know these things have to be the same, then I'll make a consistent decision across all the shapes. Um, I haven't given you a very good answer, but that's all I know right now. Oh, yeah. Yes. Uh, so uh, your platonic couch say, is, uh, is defined by a bunch of uh, maps between images of cows. Um, would it be possible to use that to make uh, the cow uh, something that um, to generate a 3D evocation of? No, that's really the same question that Dimitri was asking, whether you can go from this fantasy object to a real object. And uh, I think this is non-trivial, yeah. non-trivial. However, what probably is, is, is not so difficult is to take this network and make it into a cow classifier. When you give another image, can you find the cow in there or not? By simply linking it into the network. But the co-segmentation is a three-dimensional concept. It, it is, uh, it is, uh, it is. Uh, it is. That's what I'm saying. This really is slum at an abstract level. I have glued together, I have told you how to glue together all the images of different cows into some common thing. And that common thing is like it's a platonic cow. Okay. Thank you very much.